There are plenty of misconceptions in the case of a nuclear attack. As a nuclear specialist trained in the military, I'm here to tell you what to do, and more importantly, what not to do if such an event transpires. Especially since a nuclear attack is completely out of our control, all we can do is prepare and be ready as much as possible. This first video is simply just an introduction into a nuclear attack and how it will actually propagate onto the United States and our soil, and of course, what to do along with that. I will certainly spell out as simple as possible what that means, how it's going to take place, and again, what we can do to prep for this. But understand there's multiple things we need to look at. Fatalities from a nuclear detonation have come from multiple sources. It's not as simple as you might think. So therefore, this is a nuclear series. This is not simply just one video. Again, this is the introduction to it. The next following videos will go through all the different things you need to prep for, because there's a lot. First, up to half of the fatalities will die from the blast itself. This is literally impact from the blast or from the debris. Almost all of these fatalities will be from collapsing structures. We'll cover the best strategies to survive the blast in the next video. Be sure to stay tuned. More videos will include burning structures, radiation and fallout, nuclear power plant failures, EMPs, and more. Each video will explain in detail the best strategies to overcome those specific obstacles. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about nuclear bombs themselves or nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, the first two dropped on Japan. They were actually very low yield nuclear weapons compared to a lot of them today. Even today, we still have some lower yield ones, but they were exceedingly small. Uh, what we actually had first was Little Boy dropped on Hiroshima. It was about 16 kilotons. Then we had Fat Man dropped in Nagasaki. It was about 21 kilotons. And if you don't know what a kiloton is, literally kilo means a thousand. So it's the one on Nagasaki was 21,000 tons of TNT. That's how big the explosion was. Both of the bombs were very close as far as size goes. They both had a blast radius of about a mile. Not very huge when it comes to nuclear attacks. Now, compared to our modern nuclear arsenal, even though we have some very, very large weapons, in the United States, most of our weapons, by the way, are tactical nuclear weapons, 500 kilotons or smaller. And although that seems small, that's huge compared to the ones dropped in Japan. And more so, Russia has even larger ones. Russia's always about huge compared to us. Now, a really quick way to understand a nuclear detonation and the yield, how big the bomb is, is the size of the mushroom cloud. If you look at the original ones on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they almost didn't even look like a mushroom at all. The, the mushroom cap was very narrow, the stem was very thin, and it looked, looked very long and straggly. However, the larger the mushroom cloud, as far as the cloud itself goes, the thicker the stem, the higher the magnitude of the nuclear detonation. It's a real easy way to see how big the detonation is. When a nuclear detonation actually takes place, inside of it is a massive, massive fireball. Extremely hot. So hot for the fact that it's about 200 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 100 million degrees Celsius, five times hotter than the sun. And as that giant explosion goes out of that heat, you've probably heard before, hot air rises. So sure enough, that giant fireball moves upward and what's included in that fireball, by the way, is the ground, some dirt, you know, that was underneath a lot of it, mind you, buildings, cars, other things too, are all pulled up into that fireball, which actually heads up into the upper atmosphere. The upper atmosphere is so cold that when it hits it, it literally gets pushed out, and that's how the mushroom cloud forms. Okay, it's pushed out from the top. But a giant vacuum occurs at the base. We'll definitely see this in further videos. And as the vacuum occurs, it literally sucks things into that giant mushroom cloud. And that's actually another way a lot of the devastation takes place. Now, our scientists learned from the beginning that when detonating a nuclear weapon, doing it on the ground was actually not the best way to do it to cause damage, by the way. So most of our nuclear weapons are actually set for what's called an air burst. Here's a city, it'll actually explode above the city pushing downwards and actually causing problems then going up as far as the fireball goes. We have actually found out it causes much more destruction by bursting in the air first. The first thing you see in a nuclear detonation, of course, is the flash, the thermal radiation giving off. Ironically, a lot of the energy in the nuclear bomb is given off in that flash. There's nothing we can do but make it go out. That's not the purpose of the bomb. But that flash going out, that thermal radiation can actually cause damage too. 
Um, let's go ahead and instead of talking about like a 21 kiloton weapon like we talked about before, or in America, 500, let's go ahead and use a one megaton nuclear detonation for an example, so you can see basically how, the, how this all plays out. Now, why did I pick randomly one megaton? I didn't. Like I mentioned, in the United States, many of our, if not most of our weapons are actually 500 kilotons or smaller. They're actually made for smaller, precise targets. However, the Russians, by the way, on their subs, in their missiles, over a thousand of their nuclear weapons, over a thousand of them are about one megaton. Absolutely huge compared to what we have. So if you're actually gonna be in the United States and a nuclear bomb hits, probably from Russia, and if it is, it's probably gonna be a one megaton bomb. So let's go ahead and use that as our base to understand what we're gonna be expecting when it hits. Okay, for a one megaton bomb, people who are about 13 miles away, that flash will actually cause them to be blind, temporarily, mind you, on a clear day. However, if it's at nighttime, you know, because at nighttime your pupils are a lot further open and a blast goes off, 53 miles away on a clear night will cause that blindness. Now the blindness is only temporary. They're not gonna like it, obviously. But we're only talking about, depending on the atmosphere and everything else, lasting from a few minutes to upwards of maybe 40 minutes. Either way, within an hour, the blindness is going to disappear and their vision will return. Now, furthermore, if it is not a clear day, if it's raining out and cloudy, etc., that's actually going to absorb a lot of that thermal radiation and therefore the effects of the blindness, the flash blind, blindness as we call it, will be diminished. That thermal radiation, however, that flash will cause burns and not just in the eyes. And so much so that the shadows of people standing next to the buildings during the blast from Hiroshima and Nagasaki are permanently etched into the walls. They're still there today. That's the power of this thermal radiation. Okay, so let's talk about the burns. Uh, for a one megaton weapon, if you are seven miles away, um, you're, you're probably only going to sustain first degree burns. First degree burns, by the way, are simply just like getting a sunburn without the blisters, just reddening of the skin. Uh, however, if you're six miles away, it can lead to second degree burns. Second degree burns would be like a bad sunburn or burning your hand with a match you know, or a little fire where you see blistering. Now the blistering, by the way, if those blisters pop, infection can set in. So it's definitely more dangerous than having a first degree burn. Five miles away, however, you're now looking at a third degree burn. And third degree burn is where the skin's completely charged, charred and you've lost all of your integumentary layer blocking infection from coming in. Absolutely bad. In fact, they say that if you have 24% uh, of your body burned, with a third degree burn, mind you, you have an excellent chance of dying. And if you're 40% burned, you are pretty, you're pretty much gonna die. That's what it comes down to. Something else that comes into play too is age. If you have third degree burns, it actually affects you much more if you're 60 years or older and you actually have a much higher fatality rate because of this. And the same thing goes with the flash blindness. If it's cloudy out, if it's rainy out, et cetera, and actually absorbs a lot of the flash, then the burns, the burn radius changes so much so that it actually may not even cause any burns on you at all. That's great. Something else that'll help you too is your clothing. Uh, right now I'm wearing a darker shirt. That's not good because the dark clothes absorb the heat. It's actually much more likely to burn me. If I'm wearing a white shirt, it'll actually reflect off a lot of that flash heat, the thermal radiation, and cause less, a lot less problems. So, I don't know, I guess if you think a nuclear detonation is gonna happen, wear all white clothes and long sleeves and a white hat. <laughs> that might be your best bet. But obviously in those situations, there's not really any predictable way to know when that's gonna happen. Okay, and our last point is this, in this introductory video. When we're talking about the flash, when you see the flash, you literally have seconds, and that's actually being very generous. You may have a second, maybe two, before the blast hits you, which again is covered in the next video. You need to dive for cover immediately. Even if you're standing next to a building, it may not be quick enough to actually get in the building, by the way. You need to dive on the ground and huddle up. Of course, this is where the duck and cover movies come from back in the 50s, and you need to take cover because that flash hits and then the, the blast, and of course the blast kills um, upwards of half, if not more by far, of the people who die from a nuclear detonation. It's coming very quickly. Flash, duck and cover. Flash, duck and cover, get down. All right, so much more to talk about, which we will. I, one thing I wanna mention real quick though, 
when we're talking about the thermal radiation, radiation the flash and everything, you're not going to see this if there's going to be a problem with a nuclear power plant. A nuclear power plant will never explode like a nuclear weapon. It doesn't happen that way. So I'm actually going to have a standalone video when we talk about nuclear power plant problems compared to nuclear detonation series, but this is all going to be one big series, and I hope you join us for the rest of these. Thanks for watching, and let's go ahead and check out the next video.